Hello, I'm Josh Gould. Welcome to Reactor. Today we're going to be looking at, uh, as you like it in slightly deeper detail, I'll be looking at the plot, I'll be giving you a synopsis, and the context of the All the Worlds of Stage speech, and then I will finally just do a dramatic reading of the speech, completely unprepared. First things first, the plot summary. I've got it written down here, very abridged, and there's a lot more to do with it, it just isn't mentioned in this. Okay, so here we go. So basically there's this chap named Sir Roland de Bois. He dies, and he leaves everything to his eldest son Oliver, as is, you know, that's what you do in the Chief you leave everything to your eldest son. But this is with the kind of understanding or the agreement that he'll look after his youngest son, Orlando is in Roland's youngest son, Orlando, Oliver's younger brother. However, this doesn't happen because he's a bit of an ass. And the story takes place just as Orlando is about to completely rip into his brother Oliver, when he is jumped basically by the court wrestler hired by Oliver to, you know, jump Orlando. Basically, Orlando beats him to a bloody pulp, and in doing so, catches the eye of Rosalind, uh, the the love interest of Orlando in this, because you know that's what happens in in real life. You beat someone into a bloody pulp, and you're covered in ladies. As a side note, Rosalind has loads of family issues. I mean, her father was the Duke, and then he was overthrown by his brother, Rosalind's uncle, and now he's living in the ardent forest, as in her father. The two fall in love, as is the way in Shakespeare's day, but from there. It all goes completely downhill. I mean, really bad. Orlando hears that Oliver's gonna try and set his house on fire. Yeah. So he flees to the Arden Forest with his good manservant, Adam. In an even bigger twist, Rosaline's uncle, uh, his name is Frederick, decides to exile her from his, you know, his kingdom because she's more popular than his daughter. Talk about pushy parents. So when Rosalind and Celia go into the Forest Island, they take on male identities. This is kind of commonplace in Shakespeare's day, and it's just to stop the women from being mugged and raped and murdered, basically, because that's a bad thing. The next thing that happens in the play, next important thing that happens in the play, is that we actually meet Duke Senior, Rosalind's father, and he's surrounded by all of his kind of merry fellows, the chaps that left the court with him when he left as well. This includes the chap who gives the monologue, uh, his name is Jacques, we'll go into a little bit more detail of him later, and at this point, Orlando and Adam have been in the forest for a long time, and they basically charge in on their tea party, proclaiming that if he doesn't eat, he will stab someone. Yeah. And basically from here, you get your classic Shakespearean love triangle, and it all slightly goes a little bit crazy, but it all works out fine in the end. Okay, so long story short, shenanigans happen. Then, at the very end, very, very, very end, or towards the end, Oliver and Celia get married, Rosaline and Orlando get married, two characters that I haven't mentioned get married. These are Silvus, who is uh, the guy in the forest, and Phoebe, uh, who fancied Rosaline when she was a man, but didn't like Silvus, and now she likes Silvus. It's very complicated, but it's wonderful. And finally, the Duke Senior becomes the real Duke again, after his brother has a religious epiphany, and basically they all party like it's 1599. Okay, so the context of the monologue within the scene is this. The Duke and his men are sitting down to kind of have a tea party, but they can't find one last chap to their whole party. This is Melancholy Jack, the guy that gives the monologue. So Jack comes back, and he's in a surprisingly good mood considering his Melancholy Jack, and it turns out he, he's been speaking to a fool called Touchstone. Touchstone is someone that Rosaline and Celia brought with them, basically for the lols. Anyway, he goes on to say that they were basically talking about the passage of time and how you know, crazy women are. I mean, they are crazy, am I right, guys? Jack comments that if he was a fool, he would just go around telling people exactly what their faults are, kind of almost helping humanity get better. 
Duke then goes on to say that he's more likely to make it worse by giving them some sort of venereal disease. Anyway, at this point, Orlando bursts into the scene, proclaiming that he is so hungry that, I quote, he'll kill someone if he doesn't eat. That wasn't a quote. But, you know, the Duke being a nice guy says that Orlando and Adam can come eat with them, and he goes off and he goes to retrieve Adam. When Orlando leaves, the Duke says, Thou seest that we are not all alone, unhappy. This wide universal theatre prevents more woeful pageants than some wherein we play in. And basically he is saying that everyone gets miserable. After this, our chap Jack then goes on to basically describe the seven stages of life and how life can be seen as a play. And that is basically the scene. There's some other stuff that happens afterwards, but that's the important bit. The build-up to the monologue. So who is our character? Well, as I've already mentioned, his name is Jack, and he's a bit melancholy. But more than that, he thinks about things. He's basically a philosopher, but without the important part of being recognised by everybody. He is the only purely contemplative character in Shakespeare. He exists only to think and kind of please his mind, as it were. The way I see it, he's kind of there to earth the entire piece and make sure it doesn't fly too far away and start going on with some nice dream with fairies and such such. So why is he so melancholy? Why does he think about so many things? And why is he so cynical? If you'll read the play, you'll find he's really, really cynical, like worse than me. Well, we kind of figure it out by what he says to Rosaline. I don't have the exact quote here, but he does basically say that he lost all his faith in the world during his travels. So let this be a lesson, kids. Don't go to new places. The final kind of defining part of Jacques' character is that he distances himself from happy things in art. Like right at the end, when everyone's getting married, he goes and finds a cave. So he can be alone with his thoughts. He gets really melancholy. And no, a melancholy is not a fruity sheepdog. <laughs> Fruity sheet. <laughs> Melancholy. No. <laughs> uh, see yourself. Are you sitting comfortably? Good. Then I'll begin. All the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances. And one man in his time plays many parts, his acts being seven ages. At first, the infant, mewling and puking in his nurse's arms, and then the whining schoolboy with his satchel and shining morning face, creeping like a snail unwillingly to school, and then the lover, sighing like a furnace with a woeful ballad made to his mistress's eyebrow, then a soldier, full of strange oaths and bearded like the pard, jealous in honour, sudden and quick in quarrel, seeking the bubble reputation, even in the cannon's mouth. And then the justice, in fair round belly with good cap on lined, his eyes severe and beard formal cut, full of wise plays and modern instances, and so he plays his part. The sixth age shifts into the lean and slippered pantaloon, with spectacles on his nose and pouch on side, his youthful hose well saved, a world too wide for his shrunk shank, and his big manly voice turning again to childish treble, pipes and whistles in his sound. Last scene of all that ends this strange eventful history is second childishness and mere, mere oblivion. Sans teeth, sans eyes, sans taste, sans everything. <sighs> that got pretty heavy towards the end. Oh well, it's Shakespeare. Who cares? Anyway, that's enough for me today. Tomorrow I'll look more into the monologue and start analysing important lines or outlining any words that I think you guys might understand or that I don't understand because that was literally the first time that I've properly read it out loud. If you've got a spare moment you could leave some comments for me and I'll put any links in the description of any sites that I've used or all my sources basically. So, I'll see you tomorrow.